And again, we welcome everybody here this morning. God has graciously blessed us with another good day, and especially this Lord's Day in which we are, according to the New Testament, to assemble, and in that assembly, worship God in spirit and in truth. In this Bible study hour, we're going to be studying, pray without ceasing. Our speaker, Brother Bruce Stulting, was born, brought up in Carnes City, Texas. And he graduated from the Southwest School of Bible Studies in 1989, and thus I have known him and Sue, his wife, from that point forward, that is, when he entered school, where I was over working with the school then. He has done local work in Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and has been working with the Fish Hatchery Road Church of Christ in Huntsville, Texas, since 2001. He has, uh, as I said, studied at the Southwest School of Bible Studies and the graduate program at Memphis School of Preaching. He's done mission work in the Philippines. In fact, when he was over there, we crossed trails in those days uh, and in Cambodia. He preaches gospel meetings and speaks on several lectureships. He's conducted evangelistic campaigns in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri. Worked with several Bible youth camps and served on the faculty of the Rose City Bible Learning Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. And he also currently serves as an instructor for the Truth Bible Institute. He also, in secular work, works for the Texas Department of Transportation. He's going to say a little bit when he gets up here uh, about uh, the camp that we're involved in. And we would urge all the young people to be mindful of, of that. And he will have more to say about that. We want to remember that uh, the subject from the Bible is pray without ceasing. We hope you'll study along with him. Brother Bruce, come speak to us. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> A few years ago, in the spring congregation and the Fish Hatcher Road congregation uh, entered into a joint effort uh, and started the Lone Star Bible Camp. It originated in Columbus, Texas, and we've since moved to a better facility in a uh, modern woodman facility located between Belleville and Brenham. Uh, it's a beautiful location, wonderful site for the camp, air-conditioned facilities, great kitchen facilities. And each year uh, we've been kind of expanding a little bit on what we do and how we do it. Um, Bible oriented. We are very much uh, uh, interested in teaching our young people. This year we're going to be studying the book of James, Practical Christian Living, lessons from that <laughs> book. And uh, we have good, solid teachers that not only stick true to the book, but are capable of presenting that material in a way that the children can understand. The children are our future. We was looking at some history. Uh, Brother McClish was talking about some history of liberalism and anteism in the church from starting back in the 1950s and really before that. Uh, and in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and on to the present, they've really been targeting our young people. Uh, when we say Bible camp, don't be afraid. Our Bible camp is not like those Bible camps that came out of the 70s and 80s where it was really a hotbed of liberalism. It was really in danger when you sent your children there. But uh, we're interested in the future of the church, and one way that we can promote the future of the church is instilling good Christian values in our young people. And we invite you to check out our display in the book room uh, just by the fellowship hall. We also... I uh, encourage you, if you have any questions, talk to me, uh, David, the elders here. We'll be glad to answer any questions you have about that camp. Um, send your kids. Uh, it's, uh, it's affordable. I think our price is $120 a week. Starts uh, July the 20th and goes through the 25th. So if you're interested in that, check out our display. If you have any questions, be sure and talk to me sometime today. Pray without ceasing. You know, Sue was asked the other day by a friend of hers uh, what my topic was that I was going to be speaking on today, and she said, cease praying. <laughs> and, and, and the friend she was talking, she said, what? And she thought about it. She said, no, no, pray without ceasing. 
It's quite a big difference between cease praying and pray without ceasing. You know, when we think about prayer, prayer is the probably one of the greatest blessings enjoyed by Christians in this life. Uh, through prayer, we can approach God, and, and, and the Christian can find forgiveness for sins. 1 John 1, verse 9, Acts chapter 8, and verse 22. Now, we're talking about the Christian now. We're not talking about the, the alien sinner. We're talking about how the Christian can come in humble repentance and ask God for forgiveness, and the blood of Jesus Christ will wash that sin away, 1 John 1 and verse 7. We can find peace to replace anxiety, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. We can find strength from God in times of weakness, Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 16. For these reasons, Paul frequently exhorted Christians to be diligent in prayer, Ephesians 6, verse 18, Colossians 4, 2, 1 Thessalonians 5, and verse 17, which simply states, pray without ceasing. How Jesus actually understood that people could and would become slack in prayer and encouraged us to not be slack, to be constant in our prayers. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. We think about prayer. Prayer is more than just wishful thinking. In prayer, one reveals his heart's desire to God. Romans 10 and verse 1. In doing so, we, we offer praise and adoration and thanksgiving and make our requests known. Paul encouraged the Philippian brethren, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Prayer is addressed to God. All worship is addressed exclusively to God. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. In fact, Jesus taught, when thou prayest, pray to thy Father. And after this manner he said, Therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 and 9. This, thus prayer is to be addressed to God, the Father, in a reverent way. We list in the manuscript several Greek words uh, and define them from Thayer's lexicon. I'm going to pass over that and go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1 where some of those words are actually used. Paul exhorted that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Paul lists, of course, several different types of prayer here. Supplication which is an expression of need or want. It means to beg. The root word exp expresses a necessity, and thus it's an imperative. The second one, just prayer, comes from the Greek word that is more a general term, meaning, to, uh, meaning covering every form of address to God, including the idea of worship and devotion. The third word, intercession. To fall in with or join another in asking. In other words, to make a petition or plea for another. And then the fourth point uh, is thanksgiving. Expressing one's gratitude to God with a cheerful attitude. Now, let's think about some implications. Some, some acknowledgement when we pray. When we pray, we acknowledge that God exists. You know, when the Hebrews writer stated, but without faith it's impossible to please God. But those that come to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. The reality of prayer and the reality of God are inseparable. It would be absurd to think of somebody praying who did not believe in God. So when we pray, we acknowledge the existence of God. When one prays, he acknowledges his dependence upon God. The fact is, man needs God. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. John 15 and verse 5. In prayer, the finite creature approaches the infinite creator. 1 Kings 3 and verse 7. The very act of prayer is an act of faith in which one expresses his dependence on a greater power. In prayer, one acknowledges that God hears prayer. Jesus instructs, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Jesus, uh, James chapter 4 and verse 8. Prayer is not an act of futility. You know, a lot of people really don't pray because they don't see the benefit or the power in prayer. But it's not 
an act of futility. God would not draw close to man if he was not able and willing to hear and answer their prayers. Peter assures us that the eyes of the Lord upon the righteous and his ears are open to their supplication. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. See also Psalm 34 and verse 15. It's reassuring to know that the creator of the universe has the time, the compassion, and the inclination to be concerned with the affairs of individual souls. Truly, the psalmist says, O thou that hears prayers, Psalm 65 and verse 2. In prayer, one acknowledges that God answers prayer. Jesus assured his disciples, And all things whatsoever thou shalt ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive, Matthew 21 and verse 22. James stated, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James 5, verse 16. Furthermore, Jesus commanded, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. And uh, he said, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receives, and everyone that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. Or what man is there among him, among you, if, he asks, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, he will give him a serpent. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. God hears and God answers our prayers. John stated... And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 John 5 and verse 14. The fact is God cares for man. And for this cause he instructs, his, uh, he instructs us to pray. He hears us. He listens to us. He answers us. Peter says, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Let's now look at some characteristics of prayer. Prayer, as we said, is an act of faith. Jesus says that our request would be granted if we ask in faith. Matthew 21 and verse 22. We need to ask believing. We need to believe that when we ask God, He will grant our request. We must have faith in God and in His ability to answer our prayers, as we already mentioned. Hebrews 11 verse 6. James stated, If any of you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For if we waver, he is like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. James 1 verses 5 through 8. If one's faith is weak, his prayers will be weak. If one's faith is weak, it must be strengthened. And the only way to strengthen the faith of an individual is through study of God's word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Prayer must be offered with the spirit of humility. The psalmist says, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And such uh, and such as, and serveth such as be of a contrite spirit, Psalm 34 and verse 18. <clears throat> James warns, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. James 4 and verse 6, God will not hear a prayer of someone that is haughty or self-righteous, because God wants us to be humble. He wants humble people, just as Christ was humble, to be before Him as we make our requests. Peter writes that one must be clothed with humility, but on the other hand, for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. Unfortunately, it appears that there are many that believe God owes them something because of their good deeds. They often brag on themselves in prayer to God. Jesus warned his disciples of this attitude in the following parable in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Now this is the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. They both go down to pray. And Jesus says that the Pharisee stood praying with himself. I thank God I'm not like other men. 
I'm glad I'm not like this publican over here. You see, he was, he was bragging on himself. And then he started listing some of the good things he did. But you know, the, the publican on the other hand, he wouldn't even raise up his eyes to God, but smote himself on the breast and said, Forgive me, for I am a sinner. And Jesus says, That man went down justified rather than the other. You know, it's interesting when Jesus talks about the, the Pharisee. He said that the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Obviously, this man's prayers, unlike Elvis, never left the building. His prayers were never heard. I remember our, our daughters was living in Teague, Texas. And Teague, Texas church is pretty, pretty wicked. Uh, and they were looking for a place to worship. And so there was a predominantly black congregation there in town. They went over there and worshiped with them for a while. And they was talking to some of the members. They said, you know, why don't the blacks and the whites worship together? That's a good question. And, the, and one of the people took him aside. One of the brothers took him aside and said, you, there's some wa uh, water stains on the ceiling. He said, you see them spots up there? He says, yeah. He says, well, the white brethren came over here one time and, and talked about unity. And, and they prayed for unity. And, and he said, you see those spots up there? That's them prayers. They never got out of the building. You know, it's one thing to want unity. It's another thing to work toward it, to be sincere about it. These people weren't sincere. I know those people over there, and I know for a fact that they were just going through the motions and doing what looked good at the time. And so here's this, here's this, here's this, this Pharisee whose prayers, even though he was praying to God, never reached him. He was praying with himself. This is the, the example we're to follow. This, this publican who prayed for mercy in humility, understanding his dependence upon God and not on his own works. Prayer must be offered in harmony with God's will. God answers prayer that is offered according to his will. Regarding prayer, John stated, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Jesus provided the example for this in his prayer in Gethsemane. In grief he prayed, Father, if thou be willing, let this cup pass from me. But he concluded, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, Luke 22 and verse 42. Too often we pray, our prayers are not answered, they're hindered because the one praying is more concerned with his own will than that of the will of God, James 4 and verse 3. Prayer can only be offered to God by those who are righteous. Peter wrote, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against him, or them that do evil, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. James stated <clears throat> that the prayers of a righteous man are effective with God, James 5 verses 16 through 18. However, God refuses to hear those who continue in sin, Proverbs 28 verse 9. This is true because sin separates one from God. When we sin, we cut off our access to God. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2. The problem that the Israelites were experiencing is God wasn't answering their prayer. What was the problem? Was there something wrong with God's hearing? Isaiah says, no, his ear is not weak that he cannot hear. What, is he not strong enough? To, can he not answer our prayers because he's weak? No, there's nothing wrong with God's strength. His, his hand is not slack that he cannot answer. Well, what's the problem? Well, your sins have separated you from God. That's the problem. We cannot continue in sin and expect God to answer our prayers. We heard a lesson on fathers and on, on parenting and, and on different things. And the idea that if we, if we sin, we cut ourselves off from the greatest privilege that we have on behalf of our family. We give up the right to pray for our children when we continue in sin. To be righteous before God, one must submit to the righteousness of God. Romans 10 verses 1 through 4. Prayer must be offered in the spirit of thanksgiving. 
This fact is continually stated in the New Testament. Consider just a few verses. Ephesians 5 and 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4 and verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Colossians 4 and verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5 and verse 17 and 18. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you think that God will help us with our present burdens. If we fail to thank him for past blessings. Think about that. Prayer must be offered with persistence. I think sometimes that we just. Uh, are, are, are half-hearted in our prayers. I think sometimes we, we make our request and then we go on and we, we wait for it to happen. Well, where's my blessing, God? I, I asked for it. But we need persistence. Jesus illustrated this aspect of prayer through two parables. First, the parable of the persistent friend in Luke chapter 11 and verses 5 through 10. And because he constantly pestered his his neighbor, his friend at the door in the middle of the night, asked him for bread to, to help uh, entertain his guests, the guy finally granted his request. The second one, Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, is the persistent widow who had a, a grievance, went, went to the magistrate, the magistrate ignored her, and finally through her persistence, he gave it to her, lest he become weary with her asking. Now, the, the fact of the matter is, God's never going to become weary of us asking. He's never going to give us something so we'll go away. But the idea is that we need to be persistent when we ask God. The virtue of persistence is demonstrated in three instances of prayer. First, Jesus demonstrated persistence in prayer at Geth Gethsemane by repeating his request three times, Matthew 26 and verse 44. Paul persistently prayed three times pertaining his thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. And I understand Johnny Oxendine prays three times for his thorn in the flesh to be taken away, which was Terry Hightower. I think that's what you said in your lesson the other day, right? So, you know, persistence. You know, but like Paul, his thorn in the flesh didn't go away. And actually, I hope Terry Hightower doesn't go away either. Even though he is sometimes a thorn, we, we have to tolerate him. And then finally, the early church continued steadfastly in prayers, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, persistence, continuance in prayer. Well, what about our posture in prayer? Should, should one's body be in a particular position when they pray? You know, in the scriptures, there's several examples of people praying while they're standing while they're kneeling, while they're sitting, uh, falling on their face, looking up, lifting up their hands. And we have scripture references for all those while they're praying. And because of this diversity of posture in prayer, we, we conclude that the posture, the physical posture in prayer is not really that important. Thus, once posture in prayer is not important, the important thing is... The posture of the heart. It's much easier to bend one's knee than it is to bend one's heart and will and be in submission into God. While one's outward posture may indicate a sense or, or, or an idea of humility, it's not always a guarantee of that. What's inward is what is important. Prayer must be offered to the Father in the name of Jesus. And we had a question on this in, in our open forum. The model prayer Jesus taught, After this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Matthew 6 and verse 9. Paul stated that Christians must do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Prayer must not be directed to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, patron saints, Mary, one's ancestors, or anyone other than God the Father. Paul stated that Christians ought to be giving thanks for all things unto God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5 and verse 20. 
This means much more than simply adding a little phrase in Jesus' name to the end of our prayers. In prayer, one must recognize the relationship that the Christian has with Christ. First, he's the only way that the Christian can approach God, the Father. In, in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And second, we recognize that Jesus is the high priest who intercedes for the Christians. John chapter 14 and verse 13, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. Appealing to God in the name of his Son can give one great confidence that God will give him what he needs. Hebrews 4 Verses 14 through 16. We can have boldness when we come before the throne of grace because we have such a high priest as Jesus. And so that brings up the question, does one have to audibly state that the prayer is being offered in the name of Jesus? There are many examples of prayer in the New Testament that do not end with the phrase, in Jesus' name. Thus we conclude that it's unnecessary we need to recognize that prayer is in the name of Jesus or by his authority or through him as we have access to the Father. However, when we think about this common practice of ending our prayers in Jesus' name, it's not that bad of an idea. We think about that this is similar to what is done in baptism. We baptize in the name of Christ. We baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now that doesn't mean there's some formula that we have to say when we're baptizing someone. But it's a good idea to demonstrate to those that are present, especially non-Christians, that this act of baptism is done in the name of Christ and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Likewise, when we pray, it's not a bad idea to say those words. And I'm not advocating that we stop or that we start or that we do it or not do it. I'm just saying that it's authorized as an expedient, but it's not demanded as a command. Jesus and his, uh, 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 in, I'm sorry, it also acknowledges the lordship of Jesus in personal prayer. Even though <coughs> we may not state it audibly, it's a good idea always to acknowledge our love and the authority of Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the practice of prayer. When should one pray? Well, having set times to pray can help create the habit of praying. There are two good examples in the Bible. First, David, who, pres who is prescribed as a man after God's own heart, prayed evening and morning and at noon, Psalm 55 and verse 17. Second, we have Daniel, a man described by an angel as one who, was, who is greatly beloved by God, who prayed three times a day, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. These great men made it a habit to pray at set times each day. The Christian would do well to follow this example. At the very least, one should make a special time each day to be alone with his heavenly Father in prayer. Yet prayer should not be limited to set times. Often special needs arise that call for special times of prayer. There are three good examples of this in the Bible. First, Jesus prayed on important occasions. Jesus prayed all night pray prior to the selection of the apostles. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. Now let me ask you a question. If Jesus is our example, we need to fix our eyes on him as the author of of our faith, as we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And he prayed all night. Ask ourselves, honestly, when was the last time we stayed up all night in prayer? Have you ever done? Jesus prayed so intensely that he broke out in sweat, as it were, great drops of a When's the last time you broke a sweat praying? You ever think about that? That you prayed with such intensity that, that you worked up a sweat doing it? Or stayed up all night or long hours in prayer? We need to look at, look, look at Jesus. Uh, oftentimes when I read through the Bible, I do so uh, with a specific purpose in mind. And I've often read through the Gospels and looked at the life of Christ and different aspects of the life of Christ. A great study as you do your daily Bible reading is to read through the gospel accounts of the life of Christ and look at his prayer life. 
Just study the life, the prayer life of Jesus. And then ask yourself, do I pray the way my, my Lord and Savior did? See, he's our example. Think about that. <clears throat> so Jesus uh, prayed on special occasion. He prayed for the Father to forgive those who crucified him. Luke 23 and verse 34. Now, if he practiced prayer only three times a day, it would be very ironic if it, that time fell when he happened to be on the cross. No, he took special occasions and offered special prayers based on that special occasion. And that's what we need to do. Another prayer. Second, Paul. He prayed in trying circumstances. On one such occasion was when he and Silas were in prison. Acts 16 and verse 25. Third, Nehemiah prayed on the spur of the moment in Nehemiah chapter 2 verses 4 through 5. He prayed for wisdom and how to answer the king. You see, sometimes things just come up and we need to stop and pray. That's the idea of pray without ceasing. And we're going to talk about that in, in, later on if we get time. Having set times of prayer will help develop experience in praying. Praying spontaneously as needs arise will help us uh, develop the disposition to pray in every circumstance. Jesus encouraged his disciples to pray and not give up. Luke 18 and verse 1. Paul urges all Christians to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. He urges them to continue instant in prayer. Romans 12 and verse 12. Let's move on to our next point. With whom should we pray? Well, the simple answer is the Christian uh, must pray when he's either alone or with someone. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, it's true. And I'll prove it from the scriptures. Jesus exhorted us to pray in secret. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. Private prayer should occupy the largest portion of one's prayer life. There is value in secret fair, uh, prayer. Uh, it forms a close union, a communion, a fellowship with God. Uh, it is a true test of one's sincerity and devotion. And the benefit is what you pray in secret, the Lord will bless you or reward you openly. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. The New Testament also teaches that early Christians prayed together and they did it very often. They prayed in times of trouble. They prayed in times when, when someone was departing, like when Paul went on missionary journeys. There is a joy of fellowship and sense of strength that results when God's people pray together. You know, we used to have, before my time, what they used to call prayer meetings. I've never been to one, but I, I can imagine what that was. I think it would be much like the first century church that came together and prayed earnestly over certain things that were going on. Perhaps we may need more prayer meetings of that nature. <laughs> For what should we pray? Well, the scriptures indicate some of the things that one is to pray for. One should pray for himself and his family, such as their physical and daily needs, Matthew 6 and verse 11. For personal growth, Colossians 1, verses 9 through 12. They need to pray for their spouse, their children, their parents, their siblings, and so forth. They need to pray that for their nurture and growth in the teaching of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. One should pray for the community and the nation. To have such things as peace, Jeremiah 29 and verse 7. They need godly moral standards, righteous living, national penitence, and awareness of God, Psalm 33 verse 12, Proverbs 14 and verse 34. We need to pray that our rulers will rule wisely. One should pray for the church to enjoy love and unity, John 13, 35 and John 17 verse 20 and 21. We need to pray for each member to grow spiritually. One should pray for the lost so that the gospel will have free course. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1. That they might be saved. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. And for the success of those involved in teaching the gospel to the lost. Ephesians 6 verses 18 through 20. One should pray for the sick, for the poor, for the oppressed. That they may have health restored. Their spiritual strength restored. To have peace of mind. James 
5, verses 14 through 15, and James 5, verse 16. Prayers should be offered for the homeless, for the fatherless, for unborn children, Proverbs 29 and verse 7, and for those in other nations who are oppressed by their own rulers and others by outside influence from other nations. As we make our supplications known to God, we should have specific objectives in mind when we pray. Those are just a few things for which the Bible itself suggests to pray. Your needs are going to be determined by your life and your situation. And so pray for those things that are important to you. And certainly don't forget these things for which the Bible indicates we should pray. How should prayer be done in public worship? Well, obviously, obviously in public worship, we have two things going on during prayer. There's one leading the prayer along with everyone else who's listening in prayer and agreeing to the prayer. See, you pray when you're alone and when you're with somebody. See, that's how that works. Along with these two distinct aspects of public prayer, we must consider who leads in public. James stated, stated the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James 1, 5 and verse 16. Certainly, we all agree that we need righteous people to lead us in prayer. Remember, God doesn't hear the prayers of a sinner. It must be the righteous. So if we have an unrighteous person leading prayer, uh, and by the way, a little side note here, this is a part of my topic, and this isn't in the manuscript, but if we don't practice proper church discipline, and we have members of our congregations who are in sin, and they get up here and wait on the table or, or lead prayers or lead singing. Or, or what, what does that do to our worship? If we have somebody that's subject to church discipline and we fail to do it, not only does that person disqualify for taking the lead, but really every member of that congregation is disqualified because we're just as guilty of sin as that person is because we're not practicing church discipline. Amen. Let's get back to the lesson. Certainly, we would all agree we need a righteous person to lead prayer. In other words, you don't want people living in sin or a non-Christian leading us in prayer. Both, uh, or rather, but it doesn't, uh, but it matters, uh, but does it matter, rather, if a woman then who might be faithful would lead us in prayer? Well, Paul commanded, let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be in subjection, as the law says, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 34. And I permit not a woman to teach and have authority over a man. 1 Timothy 2 verse 12. Now Paul was not being a chauvinist pig, nor was he a he-man woman hater, as some have suggested. But Paul is saying that a woman should take, not take a position of authority over the man in public worship. This, this excludes her from leading prayer are taking other leading roles in the worship. That's why Paul says, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. Now let's, in the time remaining, how much time I got? About four minutes? <clears throat> let's look at prayer in relation to work. Generally speaking, everyone falls into one of three categories as it relates to prayer and work. Number one, most people either pray like it all depends on God and then they don't do anything, or other people work like it all depends on them and never pray. Both of those philosophies is wrong. There's a third proper category that is scriptural, and that's to pray like it all depends on God and then work like it all depends on you. And so which category do we fit in? One should pray hard and work hard. In doing so, uh, God will bless their efforts. Nehemiah was a great example of one who practiced this principle. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He prayed for God's mercy upon his own sin and for those of his father's house. He prayed for God's wisdom before making requests to the king. He prayed for divine protection from, from his adversaries. He prayed for strength to complete his mission the restoration of the wall of Jerusalem. He also prayed for God's protection upon the, the restoration work. At the same time, 
He was also a man of hard work. He mobilized the people to work of, uh, and the work of restoration. He divided the work. Some people did construction work. Others were on guard day and night watching for the enemy's threat. He was so busy supervising the, and overseeing the work that he hardly took time to change his own clothes. He did not hesitate rebuking, confronting, and reforming the people whenever they did wrong. He did not demand special provision as the burden was heavy on the Israelites. Ne Nehemiah is truly a model of the principal relationship between work and prayer. One must be instant in prayer and at the same time keep trying no matter how difficult the task. Remember, without God, you cannot. And without, without you, God will not. For this cause, the Christian must Pray without ceasing and work without quitting. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, and 1 Corinthians 15, and verse 58. Thank you for your time. I've long appreciated Brother Bruce and Sue, their dedication to the Lord. Many of you know that they faced a great deal of trials and sickness and health and loss. And I'm sure you don't get through those holding your faith like the Bible teaches we must have it without understanding the importance of the New Testament's teaching, the whole Bible's teaching on prayer. Brother Bruce serves as one of the elders of the Fish Hatcher Road congregation as well as their preacher. And I think he's brought a great lesson when it comes to the privilege and the responsibility and the blessing of prayer and what it means to us to be faithful. We tried in putting together this whole uh, lectureship to bring out those things that are absolutely necessary for us to be faithful to the Lord and to grow in these things. Of course, we couldn't cover every little nuance of it, but I think we've done a pretty good job in uh, setting out what is involved in being faithful to the Lord once you become a member of the church.